This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, now I want to start off with uh, a question uh, for Cecilia. I think this has got to be on everyone's mind. What motivated you to make this film? And what sustained you through what was such an arduous production process, uh, especially with um, uh, nearly six years in production, I believe? Well, we shot for four years, and then we um, edited for another year, so it was five altogether. Yes. Um, and I just, you know, want to thank you and Richard Hutton and the film department here for showing this film. I think it takes a lot of courage to program a film like this. Um, we've been screening in festivals all over the world, but there's no place more important for this film than on college campuses, and particularly UCSB. Um, for me, one of the true heroines of the film came from the school, and we can talk about her later. Um, but to answer your question, um, is this on? Am I good? Can you hear me? Okay. So Lenore came to the States looking for um, a team of women filmmakers to follow her journey once she um, decided that she had healed enough to speak out about rape and tell her story. And, she has always wanted to do that since um, the rape and her crowning happened in such close proximity. She felt that that must have been for a reason. And the night that she was crowned with the tears streaming down her face, she was vowing to herself that she would one day tell her story and uh, speak out and encourage other women not to stay silent. So um, she, had, she saw Shut Up and Sing, and she liked the intimacy and the journey of that film. And she asked to meet me, and I sat down with her, <coughs> along with um, Inbal, our, my co-producer and other editor on the film. And Lenore was so unashamed to talk about rape. She said, why should I be ashamed? The fault was his, not mine. And I realized I'd never heard anyone um, who wasn't very shy and embarrassed and even unwilling to speak about it so openly, so that made a really strong impression on me. And um, also what she said about her mother, that from the moment it happened, her mom had said, Lenore, go to the police, go to the hospital, we're going to support you, just don't take a shower and go straight to get help. And she said that changed the rest of her life, because if her mom had said, well, what were you doing in that car? Or, you know, She would have stayed silent and buried it, and it would have been so much harder to heal. And, she was able to collect the DNA evidence and seek justice. So all those were the things that made me want to tell her story on film. Yes, it is, it is uh, funny making a film where people are told to shut up, <laughs> and then with the Dixie Chicks, and then being able to make a film you know, well, that's about very I'm much I'm very inspired by women out. who stand up for what they believe in and looking at the cost of courage the toll that it takes, and for me this film is about the courage that it takes to seek justice and that you can heal even uh, though it might be hard and you can take a step forward and two steps back, um, but it's so important to, to get help and get support and um, speak about it. And that's what motivated you, just the power of her story and her willingness to speak. And then what sustained you through the filmmaking process? Um, you know, I was very inspired by Lenore. Um, I think we all were, and especially when it turned out to be much harder on her than she anticipated. Um, but I felt that, you know, if she's willing to go through this, no matter how hard it is, because she knows she can make a difference, then it was just mm -hmm. very motivating for all of us who worked on the film. Yeah. I have to ask, too what your biggest challenge was. My biggest and challenge? 
Um, I am a, I'm a, a victim of rape myself. I was raped when I was 18, and I thought this was was behind me, and I worked through it, and I was fine with it. And but I was very interested when Cecilia approached me with this a project because it was very close to my heart, thinking that it was just going to be you know one more amazing movie. You know because there's so many fantastic documentaries being made, and this was. But the moment I started going through the footage, it was so hard. Um, I had to stop watching footage not at 4 o'clock, because otherwise I started having nightmares. And I started relating so much to Lenore, what she was going through. Because you know, when, when Cecilia started this film, we didn't anticipate the, the transformation through religious transformation and all the setbacks that she went you know, through making this movie, post-traumatic syndrome, basically. And I kind of went through a similar, much smaller uh, scale by watching, you know, 200 interviews, 300 interviews of women that went through, but actually gave me also an opportunity to overcome mm -hmm. area where I was obviously not healed, but this kind of helped my healing too. And, and, and I'm very committed to help this project, you know, to be seen as much as possible. And we have um, a sign-up sheet if anybody wants to uh, get our newsletter or follow our progress. Can you? Pass it around for us because we're growing a movement and you're all part of it. Um, and anybody who tweets our handle is Brave Miss World, our hashtag is I Am Brave. Please say that you were here and if the film inspired you, um, right. we really want to be part of um, the, the conversation. Yeah, because speaking up is the key in this case, of course. Yes. Yes. Uh, Tying this to our own campus, um, uh, Jill, you're so well placed to tell us uh, what's the pulse on the campus now around uh, sexual assault, and also how does that resonate with everything else that's going on now nationally? I mean, with the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault, yeah. and, uh, and uh, the Department of Education investigation of 55 universities. Uh, for having violated Title IX uh, laws in their handling, or lack of handling, of uh, sexual violence and sexual harassment complaints. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting time to be on this campus, and I think we all probably are um, aware of the really highly publicized assault that happened um, here in the winter term, and that that really brought up a lot of issues for people and, and feelings and raised awareness about this issue in a way that I think hadn't happened um, in recent memory. And I've been on this campus for two and a half years, and there's been more conversation about this issue on this campus due to that um, one particular incident um, than there has been in the t entire time I've been here. And so you, you, know, you have a sort of movement on campus, and um, students really activated around this issue, as well as administration. They really take this issue seriously. They want their students to um, have resources if they are impacted by interpersonal violence. And so I think that there's a really interesting juxtaposition between what we saw in the film and people rallying behind um, you know, a convicted rapist on campus. And then you see um, you know, the reverse of that recently in the, in the most recent two quarters on this campus that we had um, you know, scads of students coming in and saying, I want to host a rally in honor of the person who was impacted. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hope that means that we've had progress. I wasn't here when um, the incident in the film took place, but I, I do feel really proud of the, the way that this campus handles um, those issues today. And I think that um, in looking at the White House Task Force recommendations and what's happening nationally, I think we're really fortunate right now because we're a very well-resourced campus and victims on this campus have multiple resources from you know, people in my office to um, you know, the counseling center. We have a sexual assault support group on campus. Um, and I think that a lot of campuses are, are struggling to get to that place. And so what you see with the White House Task Force recommendations, um, if I can brag a little bit, is that you know, our campus does a lot of those things very well. And um, so I think that you'll see more campuses having campus advocates and um, trying to, to build similar, um, similarly well-resourced um, offices like mine um, on different college campuses around the country. And I think that you'll see more and more of that, I hope, um, and that this national conversation and films like this uh, you know, really allow people to, to talk about it and to, to move forward on this issue that has so long gone un, 
unspoken on college campuses. Yes, and out in uh, the lobby, uh, you will be able to uh, pick up um, uh, material uh, from your project, from Brave Speak, uh, and also uh, uh, materials uh, from uh, on-campus resources here. Okay, um, I have I have a question. Unless there was something you wanted to add to that, Kathy, I had a question. Um, uh, uh, and this is start with you, but everybody can comment on this. Uh, Lenore's message and the message of the film is that survivors of sexual violence must speak out. Uh, and indeed, it's survivors speaking out uh, that has, um, and, and finding ways to use the law to compel universities uh, to address the problem of sexual violence that got us to this national focus. Um, uh, that's finally, finally starting to happen. Uh, but in your work on the ground, uh, dealing with sexual assault survivors, uh, how do you see the role of speaking out for both advocacy and for healing? Sure. I think that's um, a little bit of a tricky question. Mm -hmm. I think um, I respect and honor and I'm, I'm very touched by Lenore's story and her process of speaking out. But we also threw, saw through the documentary and her process some of the ebb and flows of the emotional toll it takes to speak out. And I think with that understanding, we can say that from an individual process, from a psychological process, it's really important to pause and let someone speak out at their own pace um, in, in the in the most safe setting, with the most safe people, with the hope that the person that they maybe speak out to first responds similarly to Lenore's mom and honors and respects and doesn't question. Um, so I think it's really an individualized process and while I really want to honor her, her voice in bringing this you know, awareness, I also want to honor those that have chosen to keep silent because they don't feel safe yet. And, and my hope is at some point uh, other survivors will feel safe enough to speak, but that the pressure isn't you either speak or else, mm -hmm. or you speak or won't be healed. I think Lenore's point is that you have to find someone you trust, mm -hmm. whether it's your friend or your mom or a helpline, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be reporting the crime or speaking publicly, but you have to talk to someone mm -hmm. and find the right person, but not keep it buried inside. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that is also one of the strengths of the film, and we've already touched on it a bit, which is uh, the absolute need for an immediate response and for a consistent and sustained support through the whole process, which can be a very long process, uh, both psychologically, legally, and in every way. Uh, so that's, um, uh, and I was wondering how that message resonates with what we do here uh, at UCSB, you know, both, you know, having in place uh, ways for people to be able to report in a safe way, mm -hmm. and then also being able to have that sustained support. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important and I think that um, we see that once students have access services in our office that they oftentimes are more likely to report to a formal authority, be that the university through the judicial system or um, law enforcement through the criminal system. And I think that um, having that initial support is also really key, like you said, and that's one of the main focus areas that our office has this year is that we're training students across the campus to um, on how to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so, um, because we know that people aren't necessarily showing up at my office first, as much as I you know, think that that would be great, um, but they're, they're telling friends and family members. And so we get lots and lots of um, you know, moms calling our crisis line and saying, you know, I, I don't know what to do. And, um, and so us having to, you know, that conversation, similar to Lenore's experience, that you know, the fact that you're calling is huge. <laughs> and the fact that your daughter felt like she could tell you that this happened to you. Um, it, you know, is a good sign that she's going to go down, you know, the road of healing. And so um, we're training lots and lots. I think we've trained over 400 students so far just this year um, in our, it's called Care Connect. And it's really just what, you know, what do you say in the moment when someone tells you that they've been impacted by interpersonal violence? And then how do you get them to, you know, a resource that can help them in a confidential way? 
Yeah, I think um, the social support piece is really important and that first contact and the response of the first contact is essential. Um, research and real students and other people that we've both worked with um, suggest that if someone honors and believes a survivor's story at the beginning, the trajectory for recovery is a lot more smooth potentially than someone who doesn't get that response right away. Um, and so that message that Lenore keeps speaking about um, that Cecilia has mentioned so eloquently of, that we need to encourage survivors to speak out and try to find a safe place to do so. It's really important that safety is, is honored and that person responds in a way that it starts the healing process and really believes the story. We've just been alone in the wilderness of the editing room for so long and it's so exciting to see it with an audience and I would really love to hear people's reactions. I know you probably have great questions, but if we don't have too much time, could we ask the audience if anybody oh, wants to respond? Is that part this, of the plan or? Those are my questions. <laughs> They're done. Okay. I was just getting ready. Um, when Lenore had that setback, as you referred to it, the sort of post-traumatic stress episode, did you halt production, either by your choice or hers, or did you edit things out? I'm curious about that. No, we, we paused for a long time. Um, actually, it was not long after we, we filmed here on this campus. Um, it was a combination of, um, you know, her rapist being allowed out on furlough and finding that out and his um, pending parole hearings, um, you know, being here um, and I think just the weight of the stories uh, that she was hearing and, and the trauma, the, the way she was triggered by her own story coming up. Um, so she basically walked away and um, we didn't know if that was going to be it or not, but um, we waited and um, I didn't take another project because I really wanted, I hoped she would come back, but we didn't push her. I felt like if I started another film, that would be another three years and I wouldn't come back to this one. So, you know, we really were vigilant in our trying to wait and support and see what would happen. And she eventually did say, I want to continue. Um, we also paused many times to raise funding, which was so hard to come by. We had funding that fell out, but we were already so committed to the film. Um, but it was a really grueling process of not being able to pay anybody and then, you know, cutting something together and showing it and trying to raise a thousand dollars to go on the next shoot. And But all of that between Lenore's um, process and having to stop and raise money kind of worked out in our favor because it took that long. And in the meantime, she went from you know, the, the girl at the beginning of the film to the totally different empowered lawyer and mother at the end, so we got to witness her whole transformation. So um, I think it was meant to be, but, but yes, we did have to stop. But, you know, Lenore really believes that it's, it's what she's meant to do is to um, help other survivors. And, and same with most of the women who spoke up in the film, who are all so incredibly courageous. But, and it was hard on all of them, but they all said that it was more healing than it was hard. That knowing that they might be of help to someone else um, made it worth it. Um, I noticed at the end of the film that he's being released this year. So how is that going to affect um, what she does? and? going forward. Yeah, uh, who knows? I mean, she's very strong, but she's also, you know, wounded. I think it's like a wounded hero's journey. But what would you say about a rapist getting out of prison? It, it's going to be a hard day for her that day. She's going to really uh, have a problem. But she has to deal with that. Like, she had to deal with other things, you know. It's the reality. He should have got 50, 60 years because yeah. this guy raped two girls that we know, probably more, before her. And the brutal rapes with sodomy and stabbing and hitting. So this guy is really bad news. I mean, statistics say that, you know, when a rapist starts raping more than one girl, it will the violence will escalate and eventually it will become an assassin. So it's really not good this man is coming out, but there is nothing can be done. Is that common that after a while the rapist then is convicted, is 
unfortunately. It's more common than not, unfortunately, you know. I don't think that rehabilitation has proven to be very successful in prison, from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and the bad news, it really gets worse and worse. That's why it's so important to press charge because charges, because once somebody's in prison, at least he will not rape other girls. So that's, it's a social duty in a sense. And also it's a healing process for who gets raped. It's, a, it's important to speak out, to, to do something about it because it will escalate. Uh, right now you said you wanted some feedback. And so I think this was absolutely inspiring. I was crying most of the time. And I think it's great, the work that you've done. And I think it's really important that we do encourage people to speak up about this. And I think and I hope that this movie will inspire others as it has inspired me. Thanks. I really hope the film is a guide for friends and supporters of someone who's been through it to know how to respond. Um, and also, I hope it, it really inspires and instructs anyone who's sitting on, you know, behind a desk when someone who may have been a victim of an assault comes in, you know, whether it's an administrator at a school or in the police department or in the legal system, to take it seriously and offer um, support and resources. You know, uh, both our sons grew up watching this movie being made, and they are soon maybe to be uh, <laughs> in university. And, you know, it's interesting because they're with boys, and she has a girl too, but I was, I've been telling my boy, you know, it's not just enough not to rape or, or to be kind and be, be gentleman, but it's very important. And I hope he will become an activist, you know, they take a stand when something is wrong. It's also important to take a stand, to be a good friend, to be a good support. So hopefully this film will inspire men, you know, young men in universities, not just be good to their girlfriends or friends, but to also be supportive of their friends and to stand against an injustice. And what kinds of resources do we have for educating men yeah. and get, getting them involved in it as their issue? Absolutely. I, um, the training I talked about earlier about how to respond to a significant other or a friend, um, we've definitely had um, Greek male leaders on campus go through that. Um, additionally, we have um, a partnership with the counseling program where we do an eight-hour bystander intervention training um, that is open to both women and men, and that's really um, directed at sort of um, flipping the script on, on the education around this issue, that it, like you said, it's not just about, you, you know, can't pat yourself on the back and say, oh, I can walk away from this issue because I'm not harming a woman, but it's, you know, a community effort and that we all are responsible for one another. And I think we've seen a lot of that conversation coming out of um, just events on campus in the past couple of quarters that people feel, felt really disempowered after that news came out and they really wanted a way to engage around this issue. And so, um, you know, it's a pretty comprehensive, it's an eight hour training and it's designed to identify, um, you know, problematic behaviors and intervene before it, it becomes a, a violent incident. Yeah, that's, that's very prominent in the White House task force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Additionally, um, in my role both in CAPS, the Counseling and Psychological Services on campus, and my great interest and in training in working with athletes, both as a student athlete myself many years ago, but also kind of my role in athletics now. I've also only been on this campus for two years, so I wasn't here um, in 2007. But just knowing that there are high profile student athletes on this campus, similar to Eric, um, that there are other role models on this campus in the Greek community and in other clubs and in um, associated students that we as staff and faculty on this campus have a role in doing some prevention work at the systems level and that it's not all just reaction and not all following the task force guidelines, but we gotta back up way up and look at from a system level, how can we address this and how can I slowly integrate into athletics and say like, hey, we need to get all of our athletes through this bystander training and all of our athletes through some of these other um, programs on campus that are more prevention focused and not just what do we do after. Um, my question is, when you first began this project, did you initially um, think to include men survivors, like male survivors, or is that something that just happened along the way? No, it, it did just happen, and um, 
We tested the film different ways with the male survivor story and without. I always felt it was really important to include that story. Um, and I'm just really glad we did. Um, I think it's hard for guys to talk about it, maybe even harder. And um, yet one in six men will be a victim of rape or assault. Um, and I think Jim Clemente's story is also so empowering that he became the FBI's top profiler of child molesters. And um, I think stories like his will give boys and men the courage you know, to know they can tell somebody. The problem with men is like, um, the story goes that if you were molested, you will become a molester. Why, this is why it's so hard for guys to talk about it because they feel, you know, really they're going to be framed as potential molesters. So it's very, very difficult. And the, his story becoming like actually an activist, it's, it's a good story. Was everybody glad to see the male survivor story in the film? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Considering the heaviness of the testimonials throughout the film, did you yourself um, have to go through any like specific um, therapy for that? Because you're watching that on a day-to-day -day basis. And I know Elisa had spoke a little bit about that. So I'm just wondering, you as the lead director, how that impacted you? Um, well, the whole process was very, very emotional. Um, I'm not sure I had the adequate um, training you know, in starting out, I, none of us knew what it would be. Um, I was glad to have Eliza by my side. Um, I think that uh, we all, um, I mean, for me, I developed um, a great deal of well, awareness and sensitivity um, to the issue that I, that I didn't have before. Um, as far as going to therapy myself, I mean, we all have reasons to make work and art, you know, that come from somewhere deep, especially a project that takes five years of your life. Um, you know, I was, I went to Princeton. I, I, you know, it was not a safe place then. I'm not sure it is now. Um, I think, you know, most of us have been touched by some kind of assault um, that we didn't welcome at some point or another, whether you knew how to describe it or not. So, um, Yes, it, you know, it brought up a lot, um, but again, I just think Lenore's courage was so inspiring, and um, I feel like it's the most important film I could ever do. And you know, I, um, there, there were moments that got really, 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 really difficult. Like, Lenore would not allow the crew inside the room. She would want to be all by herself. She wouldn't let even Cecilia talk to her. The whole crew, everybody was in the kitchen trying to figure out how to talk to her. She was completely like going crazy. And Cecilia, I mean, I've seen a lot of directors work, you know, it's just like it's your life is on the line. You're putting all your resources, all your energy, or your family, you know, you don't see your children going to sleep at night. You travel during your husband's 50th birthday. <laughs> you like, you're just putting all your energy in. And when then the time comes, she doesn't want to talk to you. You know, she's having a mom. <laughs> and, and Cecilia was so, Graceful, I have to say. I was looking at her. She was really, you know, regal in her way. She would back off and not pushing her and wait so patiently when Lenore was ready or even suspended, suspended her, trying to find a therapist. So it was an incredible process to see her. The endurance Cecilia had was amazing. And Imbal, you know, who's not here unfortunately tonight. It, it was a very hard process, but it was great that everybody was able to push through and make this movie happen. Are there plans to distribute this movie outside of college campuses? Oh, yes. We, um, we just signed a deal with Netflix. Um, yes. We're going to be broadcast as a Netflix exclusive um, airing on May 29th. Oh. Yeah. And are there any uh, upcoming uh, uh, events uh, around this film? I mean, what do you see? What is next for you and this film? So we're continuing our screening series. We're still screening in festivals and on college campuses and in schools. Um, we'll have our Netflix broadcast and then we'll follow that with DVD distribution. Um, 
But I, all our um, upcoming screenings are on the website. Anybody can, you know, go on and find out where we're screening and, and also, you know, host screenings in their communities. Is it screened in Israel? Yes, we premiered in Tel Aviv in um, January, and it was a huge success. We got great reviews there. Um, it aired on Reshet, Israel's Channel 2, and um, was extremely successful. Um, and Lenore, who was already speaking out about rape, is now in such demand as a speaker in Israel. She you know, can speak up to five times a day as a you know, motivational speaker and speaking out about rape. Um, so she's really busy with that and, you know, when she first spoke out after her trial, when she was only 18, she made one public statement. She said to all the women in Israel, if something happened to you, don't be afraid to report. If I can do this, you can too. And the calls to rape centers nearly doubled in that mm -hmm. year. So the film was her way of seeing if she could accomplish that on a more global scale. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to have a screening in Italy, which, you know, the movie has a screen in Italy. I'm Italian, but also the crime happened in Italy. It's been hard in Italy, because Italy has a high rate of violence against women, and it's not a friendly country right now for that theme, but we're gonna push through, and we wanna do an event there, and so that's hopefully in our next mm. big event. <laughs> okay. um, my question is the last victim at the very end where you, um, where they, you know, you kind of met her at the cafe. Um, how did that just happen? Is it just because she was like thanking God and you know that it happened and she got to meet? Um, how did that? Happen? You know, to me that was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen in my life. We'd been searching for her. We had a private detective. We'd been hunting her down. We could not find her, and then there she was. Um, but nobody ever mentions it. I think it's too unbelievable, almost, that yeah. it actually happened. And um, Lenore, you know, who knew that some of us might be kind of skeptical about her, you know, religious beliefs, was saying, "You see, it works. It works." <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I I have no way of explaining that, but but it was very real. We were shooting somewhere else in Milan. I think, were you with Lenore? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, what was happening was we, because Lenore was at that point only ate, you know, specific food has to be like kosher food. So in Milano, it's not exactly easy to find food like that. And she wouldn't drink wine unless it was. So it was a really hard uh, time. Enrico, the uh, producer on this. Oh, segment, yes. And he, Enrico Mastracchi Manas, our, our producer from Italy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He was having such a hard time to find us places to eat, and then, so everything was closed. Oh my God, we ended up in this place. It was like outside of Milano. It was only an ice cream place with some sandwiches. The taxi driver didn't want to drop us off there, saying that it was very dangerous. I'm thinking, where are we going? We're all gonna get raped here today. <laughs> <laughs> we get off, and all of a sudden, she's sitting there and this woman comes up and she recognized her and that was it. That was really incredible. So we weren't there, so you were calling me to come with the camera yeah. and Moti shot it on his iPhone. iPhone. That's how we got that footage. She didn't want to be on film and then by the time we got there with the camera we interviewed Lenore. Um, but she recognized, the girl recognized Lenore. By the time we got there, world. the girl left because she didn't want to be filmed. Mm -hmm but we had the footage on, phone, on the phone and we wanted to honor her need not to be seen because at this point she was married with three children. She was part of the community, did not feel like. But he I, took her to the same place outside Milan with the knife, the same crime. He tied her up, stabbed her, threatened her. She pressed charges against him, but um, the judge didn't believe her. He had witnesses lying for him, saying that he was with them at that time. Um, so it was very humiliating for her to have gone through that, to have tried to come forward and then been shamed and embarrassed in court. So she really, you know, never wanted to even talk about it again. Um, but she, she had called Lenora when she read about Lenora's trial. So when she saw her in the cafe, you know, she had this impulse to go forward, but she didn't want to be on camera. I mean, Lenore, who's 
believe that the fact that we weren't there as a crew actually enabled this woman to come forward because she didn't see a crew. If we would have been there, she would have never come forward. Mm -hmm. So that was also maybe a blessing in, in his mm -hmm. guys that we weren't there. So, we, but we were still able to shoot a little something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that Milan shoot was intense because she had to, you know, go back in all the whole. I mean, even the place where she was living as a model. I don't know if you noticed that she was living underground. I mean, Dungeon. the way that's a whole other chapter that didn't make into the film because, you know, of course, we have to make choices, but you know. Life as a model in Milano is not an easy mm. life. Uh, you are preyed over, you know, by men of all sorts and treated like, you know, a chicken or something, you know, in that coop under there. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Okay, so let's thank all of our panelists and join us out in the lobby.